I've been covering a lot of serious games recently, and frankly, it's getting a little depressing to talk about. So, today I thought I'd do something a little bit different. You may remember a while ago when I decided to take on the task of reviewing the original Resident Evil trilogy, and it's one of my videos that I really enjoyed making and thought the end product came out quite well. So, I decided to do it again, but this time we're covering a different kind of game. We are covering one of the most famous platforming mascots of the mid-90s, Crash Bandicoot. The original PlayStation has gone down in history as one of the most successful and varied consoles that ever released. It had all different kinds of games, from third-person action games to JRPGs, skateboarding, survival horror, and the topic of today's video, platformers. June 1996 saw the release of Super Mario 64, which changed the platforming game forever. It was the first ever 3D collectathon, but also presented so many challenging levels now that Mario could move in three dimensions. The PlayStation had released in 1995 as an opposition to the Nintendo 64, with some major changes that made it very successful. Nintendo was still using the cartridge format to store games, on which you could only store 64 megabytes of data, meaning that audio was severely compressed and textures couldn't include a lot of detail. This didn't stop developers like Rare from making amazing games, but it was more expensive to develop and release games for. Meanwhile, Sony had started using the CD format to store its games on, which were cheaper to manufacture and put games onto. Plus, the disc could hold more data, allowing for more sound effects, music, and higher quality textures. The console also had memory cards instead of saving to the cartridge, meaning if your disc was scratched and you had to get a new one, you could load from your last save game without having to play it all again. Unless you didn't have one, in which case you always had to start from the beginning anyway. Coming back to Crash though, he was developed as a competitor to Mario and a potential mascot for the PlayStation itself. The game was made by Naughty Dog, who went on to make Uncharted and The Last of Us. But before they did any of that, they made an absolutely incredible trilogy of cartoony platformers that have lasted all the way to now with kart racers, endless sequels slash reboots, from the ground up remasters of the original games that started it all, and even a brand new title that followed them up properly. Crash had quite the development and went through a number of designs before becoming the Bandicoot we know and love. He was originally going to be a Wombat or a Potteroo, with the Wombat design in particular even being given a name, Willy Wombat. I never said it was a good name, I said he had one. Although, it's better than the name given to the game while it was in development, the Sonic's Ass game. I'm not kidding, look it up. It was called the Sonic's Ass Game in development. After landing on the Bandicoot as their animal of choice, Naughty Dog named him after what he does in the game, which is crashing into boxes. Real creative there, Naughty Dog. Of course, I wasn't born in the period of time that these games were released, so my first introduction to them was through YouTube, and then playing them when the Insane Trilogy remaster was released in 2017. And this video marks the first time that I am playing the original PS1 versions of these games. One small note is that despite the fact that I own physical copies of all these games, I still chose to emulate Crash 1 because of one small detail I'll talk about soon. So that's why it looks a little different to the other two, as I played them on my actual PlayStation 2. But with all of that out of the way, let's hop, skip and jump straight into Crash Bandicoot, released in 1996. Crash 1 is a hard game to go back to. Not because of the graphics or the level design, but instead because of the controls. The graphics haven't aged amazingly, everything is very angular and a little rough around the edges, but overall, textures are nice, lighting is pretty good, especially in the darker levels, but the game is still more than playable for audiences today. There's even a really cool trick with Crash's spin move, which is that the spin has its own separate model with multiple noses and eyes to save on processing power. I think that's really cool. Textures are quite nice as well, whether it's Crash's fur on his back, luscious jungles or ancient tombs, they all look really good for an early PS1 title. While Crash is a 3D platformer, it's actually more similar to the original Super Mario Bros on the NES, with Crash only being able to run, jump and spin. All the other buttons that the PlayStation controller had went unused, and because the DualShock wasn't out yet, it uses the D-pad to move, which I can tell you is killer on the thumb and doesn't pair well with precision platforming. It's so hard to be accurate with this setup, and in the boulder chase stages, you'll be praying for it to end so that you don't end up with blisters, and landing on single boxes? Don't make me laugh. I missed so many jumps because of these controls and the jumping physics, which I'll get to in a minute. What is Crash Bandicoot actually about? 
Surely Crash isn't just jumping across all these obstacles for no reason. That is correct. Believe it or not, there is actually a story to this game. Crash is a genetic experiment who escaped from the evil Dr. Neocortex who wants to create an animal army to take over the world. Crash was meant to be his general and despite him escaping, Cortex still has Crash's girlfriend Tana captured and Crash has to go and save her by jumping his way across the Insanity Islands defeating all of Cortex's minions and rescuing her from his tower. It's a fairly simple story along the same lines as most of the Mario games, but I quite like it. You don't play Crash for the story, you play it for the platforming. And on that side, Crash 1 is a fantastic time. The only thing I'm not fond of is that the opening cutscene that shows who everyone is and what we're doing is only viewable by leaving the main menu sitting for a while. I feel like this should have been placed when the player hits new game, as while it's not vital, it might help hook some more people into the game. The level design of Crash Bandicoot is as pure here as it gets in terms of platforming challenges, but also the jumping is at its most unrefined. What I mean by that is that Crash feels a little… floaty in this game. He's a heavy fucker. He has too much horizontal and barely any vertical momentum. Along with this, he plummets to the ground like a sack of potatoes. This means that any sort of tight jumps is nigh impossible if you don't jump at the exact right moment, because any adjustment in midair will drag you across the screen and make you miss the jump by a mile from just a slight tap of the directional buttons. This made even the most simple stages a fucking nightmare, because I never knew if my jump was going to land where I planned or land on another planet, and I plummeted to my death countless times over my playthrough. Although, the one level that I was absolutely dreading was actually made a lot easier with the floaty controls, and that was Slippery Climb. Slippery Climb is still an absolute bastard and easily one of the hardest levels in the game, and on the Insane Trilogy, this is the point where I lose most of my lives I've built up over my journey, and my attempts to beat it can easily last 15 minutes plus. But here, it took me 5 minutes and I beat it while only dying a few times. I think it was the fact that a lot of the jumps with platforms moving were made a lot easier with my hang time in the air being extended, so I was able to predict the arcs a lot more accurately than if my jump was a sharp up and down movement. My other major complaint about controls is how spinning feels. If you try to spin while running, it is as slippery as ice and I never felt good spinning and running, which led to me stopping and starting whenever boxes were involved around platforms. Back on level design, I like the map of the game that tracks your progress across the island, and each level you play matching the area of the island you are exploring. Starting in luscious green jungles, to ruined temples, bridges in the clouds, industrialised factories, old tombs, and finally ending on a blimp at the top of Cortex Tower. One of my favourite levels is Hog Wild, as it's the only stage where you're not platforming, but instead running on a hog that crash hijacks, for lack of a better word. The levels aren't all just straight lines though, some of them, like Cortex Power, have branching paths you can go down, and some have side-scrolling sections, or are entirely side-scrollers for a nice change of pace. My least favourite kind of level are the fucking bridge levels. These turtles can seriously fuck right off. Trying to jump between them over large gaps can be infuriating when they can hurt you if you land next to them, or if you jump on them at the wrong place in their walk cycle, you won't make it over the gap at all. These bastards were the cause of so many deaths that I honestly lost count. Other stages, like those in the temples in particular, had issues with the depth perception that made some of the jumps feel so scary and precarious because I couldn't tell where Crash was in the 3D space. Placed throughout the levels, along with the normal boxes, are boxes with a mask on them. This is Aku Aku, a mystical mask that's never quite explained, who gives us extra hit points. Collect three Aku Aku maths and you gain a brief period of invincibility like the star power up from Mario. In the stages as well are life crates to gain extra lives to prolong your attempts at any given stage with a maximum of 99 being achievable if you're good enough. Not that you'll need that many lives, as most of the levels don't actually last that long either, with most lasting around 3 minutes, and even the one that took me the longest lasted just 10 minutes. Crash Bandicoot isn't a long game, but it does make the most out of its playtime. Plus, the game has so much extra content you can go for if you want to get more out of it. If you just play through the stage normally like I did, they won't last you long, but if you decide to go for completion, then you'll have hours worth of content. The first thing you can go for is the gems. If you break every box in the level, including boxes and bonus levels, without dying, then you will get a gem for a stage. And if you do this on certain levels, you will get a coloured gem which will allow you to access extra paths in other levels to break more boxes and get more gems. 
These will allow you to access the hidden alternate ending for the game in the penultimate stage, the Great Hall. Which, if you don't have gems, is just a quick jump through to the final boss. I completely skipped over the bonus rounds. If you collect three Tana tokens from boxes through the level, you will gain access to a bonus level with a unique box breaking challenge. And Tana in the treetops. If you can get away that easy, then what the fuck am I doing? These bonus levels are actually home to my biggest complaint with the game, and the reason I chose to emulate this one, but not the others. You have to beat a bonus level or get a gem in order to save your game. That's right, you need to either beat a bonus round or perfect a level to have the privilege of saving your game. This is why I emulated, because I could save my game using save states if I suddenly had to leave, or I was done with a recording session but hadn't beaten a bonus level. This is so fucking stupid, and I am glad that every game afterwards did away with this bullshit system. Putting that aside, a small selection of levels will not only have Tana tokens, but also Brio or Cortex tokens, which will have more difficult box breaking challenges to get keys, which will give you access to extra levels. I didn't get these, hell, I didn't even get a single gem because I kept dying due to the controls. But these completion goals could easily add ages onto your playtime, while not being a completely impossible challenge if you take the time to learn the levels and carefully break all the boxes without dying. It's something I reckon I could do if I really tried for it, but I don't have the time nor the energy to dedicate to that, so I'll let others go for it instead. And I'm still not done, as I haven't even mentioned the boss fights. I've played against tougher, but these are still super solid boss fights that utilize Crash's limited moveset. The first boss, Papu Papu, is not only a big yikes, but a joke of a fight. He goes down with three bunks to the head and his attacks are super easy to dodge as long as you jump at his back and don't get caught in the wrong part of his hitbox. Ripper Roo at least has a bit more challenge, with you needing to time TNT crates to hit Roo when he lands from his jumps in three different phases, with different jump patterns in each one. I really like the Ripper Roo fight. Koala Kong is similar, with you needing to dodge boulders he throws at you and TNT crates falling from the ceiling before spinning a final boulder back at him at the end of his phase. You repeat this four times, but there's also minecarts in front of him that if you spin the boulder at the wrong time, it will hit them instead of Kong. Pinstripe is another joke, as he shoots his tommy gun before it jams and you get a chance to spin him, but as long as you're behind the chairs when he's shooting, he can't hurt you at all. Nitro's Brio is actually a bit more of a challenge. He throws two colour of potion at you, green and purple. The green ones will spawn slime monsters that have a dodgy hitbox and you can jump on to hurt him, and the purple ones will hurt you if they hit you. After a few goes at this, he will drink them both and turn into a hulk monster and you use stones falling from the ceiling to jump onto his head a couple times. And finally, Neo Cortex, who shoots purple lasers at you that you need to dodge and green ones that you need to spin back at him. As the fight goes on, you'll need to combine multiple green shots together to hurt him. He also fires blue lasers that move across the screen that you need to dodge, while also dodging purple lasers and spinning green ones. Each one of these bosses gives a pretty decent and distinctly different kind of challenge to one another. Some test your platforming, others test your planning, and some test your ability to memorize attack patterns phase after phase. Except Papu Papu. He's just kind of there, having a good time, vibing out, being a racist stereotype. I can honestly say that the music in this series is top notch, as well as the sound design, and that extends all the way back to the original. Josh Mansell did a great job composing all the tremendous pieces you hear throughout the game, and the stages would be lacking something special if the musical accompaniment was either different or not there. My favourite song in the game is actually Slippery Climb. But other great shouts are Jaws of Darkness. The Aku Aku Invincibility theme. Or the main theme. These tracks are timeless to me, and every time I think of Crash Bandicoot, I think of the amazing soundtrack that goes with it. On the sound design front, the sounds for Wumpa Fruit, Boxes Breaking, and especially 
especially the ricochet noise. It's so satisfying every goddamn time. So, Crash Bandicoot, a simple but fairly well done early 3D platformer for the PlayStation 1 that would go on to spawn a whole set of sequels and spin-offs for years to come, and laying the groundwork for what would become possibly my favourite series of platformers ever released. The game does stumble in a few areas and the controls could do with some tightening up, but damn, this is such a super solid first attempt and the platforming would only get better with time. I don't recommend that you break the bank to try and buy a copy of the game to play it right now, but if you ever want to see where the Bandicoot got his start, maybe consider checking it out after you've played the other games or played the Insane Trilogy remaster that fixes most, if not all, of my problems with the original game. But now we leave Crash 1 behind and move forward a year and a month into the future with the release of Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back. You heard right, Crash Bandicoot 2 was released a year and a month after the original, and yet, despite that short amount of time, it makes strides in how Crash plays that makes it far easier to come back to. The first improvement is in the tightness of the controls. Crash no longer floats across the screen, but he has a tight jump arc with just the right amount of hang time in the air. On the controls, we no longer need to use the D-pad because by this time, the DualShock existed, so now we have full analog control. This makes precision a lot easier since you can actually move at different speeds by pushing the stick to different degrees, meaning that you can make small adjustments to your positioning without having to run a marathon back through the stage first. There's also a slight graphical improvement. It's not a massive leap, but things aren't as angular this time around. The edges are a bit smoother looking and textures have a little more detail to them. Environments are more varied as well. Crash 1 didn't lack variety, but Crash 2 has jungles, ice levels, polar bear riding, space levels. It's insane and it really does make each level feel more distinct compared to the first game, which occasionally has some levels blur together in my mind. Back on the gameplay, Crash has some new moves to play with. He can run, spin and jump just like before, while of course feeling a lot tighter, but if you press the circle button, Crash will crouch down. Seems pretty useless to me, but crouch while running and you'll perform a slide. Crouch and jump and you'll perform a higher jump, and the last new move in the arsenal is the slide jump. The slide jump gives you some extra momentum as well as extending the arc of your jump by quite a bit. I love using this move and in some areas of the game it's flat out required to get certain boxes or sliding into certain enemies who can't be defeated otherwise. Only complaint with Crash 2's controls are the heavy as fuck ice physics that, similar to spinning while running in Crash 1, have way too much momentum to them and take all that precision that Crash 2 has added in and just takes it all away which is a shame in such a great feeling platformer. The biggest change up from Crash 1 is in presentation. Rather than entering each level one after the other through a map, we now have a warp room, which would become a staple of the franchise up to Twin Sanity. Each level of the warp room has five levels for us to access in any order that we want, so if you find one particular level challenging, you can complete another one and come back to it later. I still play them all in order, but this is a nice quality of life change. On the note of the challenge, this was by far the most challenging game in the original trilogy. There are so many hazards and weird obstacle timings all going on at once that I found myself getting stuck here a lot more than in Crash 1 or 3. I also had a consistently low number of lives, whereas in Crash 1 I was able to build up to 64 by the end of my playthrough. There are several missions that I found particularly frustrating, like hanging out or digging it, I played these two levels back to back and they led to many a frustrated moan or naughty word being shouted. I love the levels in this game. Due to the warp room being a hub for levels, the devs were able to vary up the themes a hell of a lot more. You have a jungle, ice and factory all within the same warp room rather than having all the levels of the same theme being bunched up together on a map screen. The only levels I didn't enjoy were the jetpack stages. I don't think the jetpack is absolutely uncontrollable like others seem to, but I do find it a little cumbersome and not my favourite. Crash 2 introduces a few other things within the levels to help spice up Crash's gameplay even more. The biggest staple addition is Nitro Boxes. These are similar to TNT boxes in that they explode, but the difference is that TNT has a timer before it blows up, but Nitro will blow up immediately upon contact with it. 
These add a whole new tension to tight platforming segments, especially when normal boxes are placed next to, or even on top of the nitro boxes, which never stop being terrifying. It also introduces death routes if you can make it to a certain part of the level without dying. I didn't manage to get footage of this, but I do know that these death routes are also rather difficult themselves, similar to the process of getting to them. Crash 2 introduces stages having multiple gems, with levels having box gems for breaking every box in the level, which missing one is so fucking frustrating, and you can find colour gems to access hidden extra routes in other levels. Some colour gems can only be collected by finding a hidden warp from another level back to a previous one and coming at the stage from another angle to finally grab it. I like these as they are often just hidden enough that you feel really smart for figuring it out, but they make sense when you do some extra thinking. Apart from the blue gem, which can be grabbed only by getting through the first level without breaking a single box. Crash 1 didn't have a main objective or much of a story, but in Crash 2 the story takes a step forward and becomes more prominent. It opens immediately after Crash 1's ending with Cortex falling from his airship into an old temple where he finds a crystal. Quick note here that Cortex has a new voice actor in the way of Clancy Brown, most famously known for playing Mr. Krabs. We skip forward one year to Cortex and new character Engine working on a space station where it's explained that they need 25 other crystals to properly power the Cortex Vortex to take over the world, and Cortex decides to recruit Crash to help him gather the crystals as he has no more animal army left on Earth. We see Crash and his sister Coco relaxing when Crash is kidnapped and brought to the warp room. Throughout the game, Cortex will talk to you about collecting crystals as he's turned a new leaf and there's a new threat on the horizon, while Coco and Embryo from the last game tell you to collect gems to stop Cortex as he's still evil, all of which ends with us defeating Cortex, bringing the score to 2-0. On that note, let's talk boss fights. They are a lot more consistently good here than in Crash 1 and there's no such instance of a Papu Papu type boss here. Boss fights appear between warp rooms when you beat all the stages in a given room and take the platform in the centre to the next one. Ripperoo is very similar to his fight in Crash 1, but this time he's looking a lot more sophisticated. He places TNT you need to avoid and then does the same with Nitro Boxes. When the Nitro Boxes explode, Rue will be stunned for a brief period in which you can spin him and knock his health down. Do this three times and he goes down. I didn't find him overly challenging, but he's a good first encounter. Boss 2 are newcomers, the Komodo Bros. The bigger one will stand in the centre and throw swords at you, while the smaller one spins around the arena, which will eventually make him dizzy, allowing you to spin him into the bigger one and you knock down a chunk of health. Again, they're pretty easy, but I'm okay with it, because this kind of boss fight will be built upon in the next game. Boss 3 is Tiny Tiger, which I really like a lot. Tiny will follow you across a 3x3 grid of platforms that will occasionally fall away. You need to lure him into dropping into a hole three times without falling, which, depending on what platforms aren't available, can be rather tricky. This is where the slide jump can really come in handy, as you can cross diagonally or cross over fallen platforms to get to one at the opposite side. Engine is another good fight. I prefer his fight in Crash 3, but this is a good prototype. He is in a mech that will shoot lasers and rockets at you. You need to run side to side, throwing Wumper Fruit at the various parts of his suit in order to defeat him. Sadly, the game removes your ability to slide in order to make this fight work, which led to a couple deaths as I figured this out. The Wumper Fruit throwing never comes back in any other stage, so it's a weird mechanic specifically for this boss, but I'm kind of okay with it for this to just be a decent fight. And now we come to the final and my least favourite boss, Cortex. This isn't even really a fight. You fly towards him using the floaty as fuck jetpack controls, avoiding obstacles on a set path while needing to spin Cortex three times before he reaches the end of the path. It can be really hard to avoid some of the obstacles while keeping up with Cortex, and I only just barely managed to beat him after nearly 10 minutes of trying, and this, to me, was the weakest part of the whole game. The game ends with a cutscene of Crash and Coco wondering what happened to Cortex as his space station sits in orbit. This is the incomplete ending, as I didn't go for 100% completion. If you do, you get a cutscene of the space station being blown out of the sky by a laser, powered by the gems you collected. This is the canon ending that leads into Crash 3, and this is how the series will continue. The 100% ending being canon, and the un-100% telling you that there's still more work to be done. 
Once again, the soundtrack is fantastic here, with many tracks being really easy to hum along to. I don't find these ones as memorable as Crash 1, but while you're playing, they back the gameplay perfectly. I particularly love the bear riding theme. Or the theme that plays in the sewer levels. The tracks all feel a lot bouncier this time around. Even the theme of the game has had a slight rework with a more tropical feel I'd put the feeling as. Not sure to be honest. Take a listen and maybe you'll hear what I mean. So, Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back, what I feel is the hardest of the Crash trilogy, but still an excellent time. I certainly got more frustrated than this one than I did the others because of its difficulty in level design and platforming challenges, and I don't revisit it as much as Crash 1, but I still recommend that you dive in either with the Insane trilogy, or even the original, as it's still a great game that holds up far better than Crash 1. But. If you'll indulge me one last time, we can cover the conclusion to this wonderful trilogy with Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped. Yes! This is the game that sparked this whole video. I was browsing a retro game shop when I found a copy of Crash 3, and then after some searching I also found copies of Wrath of Cortex and Twin Sanity, both of which I may cover later down the line. But for now, we are in 1998, again, one year and one month after the release of Crash 2. These guys were just on a roll with these yearly releases. Crash 3 keeps the general structure of Crash 2, but instead expands upon Crash's base moveset even more than that game did. We'll start with the plot of Crash 3. Cortex's destroyed space station crashes into an ancient temple where it releases the brother of Aku Aku, Uka Uka. Uka Uka is tired of Cortex failing him over and over again, but since Cortex set him free, he's feeling generous. But instead, he brings in Dr. Entropy to assist Cortex in collecting crystals from across different periods of time. Aku Aku warns Crash and Coco of Uka Uka's evil power and takes them to the Time Twister to follow Cortex's minions across time to gather the crystals first. I love this plot. It keeps the momentum of Crash 2 going with time travel now being involved, which gives the stages even more variance than before. It's fantastic. We go all over the place, from medieval times to Egypt, the 1950s, exotic Arabia, the high seas, and even into the future. Levels can be hard as nails too, with some of the most intense platforming in the series with all of the added moves at our disposal. Crash can do everything he could in Crash 2. Spin, jump, slide, slide jump, high jump, belly flop, but all of this is made even better with the addition of power-ups. After defeating bosses, Crash will be given new power-ups, stronger belly flop, a double jump, death tornado spin, fruit bazooka, and for defeating Cortex you'll get the Crash Dash shoes. I'll come back to those later. The power-ups are amazing as they allow you to either cut stages short with some of the jumps you can make, or make your way down specific routes only accessible via using your power-ups together, like the double jump death tornado spin glide, which never stops being satisfying to pull off. I think out of all of them, the belly flop is the least satisfying to get, since it makes a move we already had stronger, rather than actually adding anything to our moveset. Fruit Bazooka is also pretty situational, but still really fun to use once you get a hang of the controls. Once again, textures have a slight upgrade since last time, with more details being found in each one, and Crash looks more like a cartoon character than ever here, which could also be said for Crash 2 compared to 1. Plus there are many quality and life improvements like a box counter and once again being able to tackle levels in any order within a set of 5. Crash is at his tightest in terms of controls, with this being the most precise platforming on the PS1. Plus there's more fun additions like being able to play as Coco in certain levels. In the pirate and Japanese tiger levels, Coco takes over from Crash to finally help us out in obtaining the various crystals and gems. Not only this, but there are more vehicle stages, including a World War I plane, a 1950s motorcycle, and an underwater scuba. 
I love all these different stages and the vehicles generally control very well. The bike is a little stiff, but mostly controllable. The scuba acts like an Aku Aku hit point that can fire missiles to help kill enemies and destroy coral that hides boxes behind it. These stages feel good as they are still focused on what Crash is always about, breaking boxes to get gems and finding crystals. The score here is my absolute favourite of the series. Every single level has a banger theme, like the Arabian stages. The prehistoric levels. And of course, the warp room. Each one of these tracks matches the stage perfectly, and I love the little detail of every type of bonus stage being a variation of the original Crash theme with the instruments of the associated time period. Now we move on to the bosses, and the first thing I need to say about them is I love that we got some characterization of them with cutscenes before we fight them. It helps so much to make this feel like there's an antagonizing force standing in your way, and not just some gimmick animal with a fight. I love it. The first one we face is Tiny Tiger, who is pretty good. He sends lions after you in a Roman Colosseum, which is really cool, before pouncing down to stab you. Eventually, he'll plunge himself into the ground and you can spin him. There's actually a funny cheese strat you can do, which is if you stand exactly here, none of the tigers can hit you, which I used once to get footage of it. But the fight is entirely possible legit. Boss number two is newcomer Dingo Dial who has a flamethrower and you need to trick him into destroying his shield so that you can spin him. He also launches flames into the air which can hit you, so watch your head. This is one of the best fights in the whole series as Dingadayo can really catch you off guard if you're not paying attention. Boss 3 is one of the hardest, Entropy. He's a very threatening presence, so going against him is pretty scary with his mastery over time itself. He will launch balls of energy at you that you can only dodge at the very last second before covering the arena in laser lines that you need to jump over. You will then make a small platforming challenge for you to reach him and hit him. Each phase takes place in a different period of time, so the background is constantly changing. This boss took me a while to memorise his patterns, but once I did, it felt really good to finally wreck him. Next boss is the only one with Coco, and it's a rematch with Engine. This is the best engine fight in the series, but also the hardest in the game. You control a spaceship while he shoots you from his mech, and you need to dodge while aiming at the different highlighted areas to do damage to him, and he can shred your health bar if he hits you. Then you enter phase 2 with Pura the Tiger joining to add more firepower, and you need to do the same again all in one go without being able to get health back, and I only just managed to beat him with 2% health left. A challenge for sure, but the relief I felt when beating him was unreal. And now we come to the final boss, Cortex, and this is a massive improvement to his fight in Crash 2, mainly because it's actually a fight and not a shitty chase. You are without Aku Aku here for the first time, as he is fighting with Uka Uka, and you have to avoid not only those two, but Cortex has bombs that he throws down before you can spin him into a hole. This is the most mechanically complex Cortex fight in the series, testing you on nearly everything you've learned over the last three games, and it's a fantastic conclusion to the trilogy. We defeat him, but Cortex and Uka Uka escape, again telling us there's more to be done. If you go for 100%, they get sucked into the time twister and sent back to the past, which we wouldn't get a proper conclusion to for 22 years, but that's for another time. This isn't where Crash 3 ends, however, because while you've been entering each level, you've probably noticed an extra collectible, and when you re-enter a completed level, you'll notice a clock near the start. This is the Time Trials. This is where you use the Crash Dash by holding R2 while you run to make your way through the level as fast as possible to get different tiers of relics. Sapphire for the minimum time, gold for a pretty good time, and platinum for a more or less perfect run of any level. I like these time trials as they make you really consider the level design and makes you wonder about how to potentially break it, playing the level in a completely different way to normal. I'm not good enough to get platinum relics, but I still enjoyed the few levels that I tried out. 
Some people think these collectibles are padding or extending the gameplay needlessly, but personally, I like the difference of challenge to beating the level normally or going for a gem, as you are optimising the stage and breaking specific time crates in order to stop the clock temporarily. You have to play the level in a new way, and that's what I quite like about it. And with that comes the conclusion of this video. I thought Crash 3 was the best game out of them all, with the most mechanics, best boss fights, best soundtrack, and the smoothest play experience. If I was to rate these games in terms of my favourite to least favourite, in terms of my enjoyment playing them, I would need to put Crash 2 at the bottom, Crash 1 in the middle, and Crash 3 at the top. Sorry Crash 2, but I just prefer the other games. So, if you enjoyed this retrospective look at Naughty Dog's PS1 platformer trilogy, please leave a like on the video and let me know what one was your favourite down in the comments below. I highly recommend that if you haven't played these games that you check them out, and with Crash 2 or 3, I can recommend playing them on the original hardware, as these versions still hold up fantastically. But for most people, I'd say get the Insane Trilogy to experience these games with updated graphics and more consistent controls across all three. I had a great time with them, and I'm interested to see what I think of the post-Naughty Dog games, but that's for another time. That's all the time we have here today, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye!